Hi, I'm Marty West, Executive Editor at Education Next, and I'm here today with Susan Eaton, who is uh, at the, Insti the Houston Institute for Race and Justice at Harvard Law School, and she's also one of the authors of our forum in the current issue, uh, Is Desegregation Dead? Uh, so Susan, is desegregation dead? No, desegregation is most definitely not dead. Um, it is more vulnerable than it's been, especially in, uh, recently. In what respects? Um, well, most recently in 2007, as you know, the Supreme Court um, decided two cases, one from Louisville and one from Seattle. Mm -hmm. And in that case, the court basically affirmed that uh, avoiding racial segregation in schools and uh, trying to achieve racial diversity in classrooms and schools remained a compelling state interest. The court also made it slightly more difficult for school districts to achieve that. But from my work across the country uh, with educators and advocates, we see many school districts and educators in those districts trying to maintain racial diversity. Yes, yeah, so how are districts responding to this decision? There was a lot of speculation when it was first made. Right. Obviously, it said you can't uh, use individual racial characteristics to assign students to a school, exactly. but you can take race into account in a, a variety of ways, Ex Justice Kennedy said. So. Exactly. And um, we see a range of responses. Um, one of the most common responses is confusion on the part of school districts, which is one reason why a coalition of advocates and researchers and thinkers uh, that I'm involved with, the National Coalition on School Diversity, is really trying to put some pressure on the federal government to more to better articulate exactly what school districts should be doing in terms of trying to create more diverse classrooms and schools and so try this to is avoid working with segregation. The office of Civil Rights at the Department uh, of office Education. Of civil, trying to trying to the Office of Civil Rights and mm -hmm. also the Department of Justice as well. But what we do see is many school districts, um, every you know every place from Omaha, Nebraska, Louisville, Kentucky, Hartford, Connecticut, really working not just school districts but policymakers in those communities as well. Work understanding that racial segregation and concentrated poverty does have um, very damaging effects on the educational quality that students receive, especially racial minority students, especially poor racial minority students, and trying to either create um, opportunities for children to go to more diverse schools, to create and improve magnet schools in those communities, and then to also um, come up with student assignment plans that may not take race explicitly into account in individual students' race, but may again, as you said, look at neighborhood boundaries, look at poverty concentrations within school districts, and try to create a plan that um, reduces racial segregation and increases racial diversity. And are these schools. strategies politically sustainable? I mean, is there support at the district level for moving in this direction? Or I uh, think that there is tremendous variation mm -hmm. with that. I mean, as we most recently saw in Wake County, North Carolina, mm -hmm. uh, the school board dismantled a plan which um, many people would have said was, if not perfect, certainly a step in the right direction to reducing segregation. And this was one. This was a plan that used uh, income exactly. in order to assign students exactly. to school income, and guarantee income, socioeconomic status, yeah. ideally. Um, and it, you're right; it was not a race-based plan. But again, there was animosity, and so it's very important that school districts, that educators in the community, better articulate. Um, why these kinds, why plans for diversity, why plans for avoiding racial segregation, um, whether they're based in housing equity, whether they're based in school assignment, whether they're based in creating more regional opportunities for education to happen, why we need to um, keep these plans alive and why we need to continually have conversations in the community level and dialogue about how they're working, if they're working for some groups more than they're working for others, and how to make them work better. And a good example of a district that's engaged in these conversations is Montgomery County, Maryland, mm -hmm. where um, educators have a very diverse school system and are working to maintain that diversity consciously and have ongoing dialogues at each school to talk about what is working and what isn't working. Uh, and action plans to try to improve each. And Montgomery school. County is a district that has seen a fair bit of success in recent years, it seems. Uh, yes, but also persistent, like like many districts like it across the uh -huh. country, um, persistent achievement gaps right. between racial minority students, poor students, and more middle class. So what are the students? tensions that emerge when a district really tries to take this, the desegregation mandate seriously? Uh, you know, what are the challenges that they face? Um, I think that I think that a lot of parents get nervous, especially more advantaged parents, um, and they operate on a perception that um, a school that becomes less white or less middle class is going to become automatically a lower quality school. And Should they so, be concerned? 
Um, the research says that they shouldn't. Yeah. No. Um, and, it, you know, but I think that those concerns need to be taken seriously and addressed in a serious, respectful manner so that people can understand both the benefits of racial diversity for all students and then also what the research actually says about um, who gains mm -hmm. in, in, terms of, in terms of these plans. Um, great. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk with us today about your work, and uh, thanks for contributing to Education Next. Well, you're welcome. Thank you.